In today's video, we are going to be addressing another question from someone in the mastery course. And this someone wanted to know how to adapt the regime filter to work on multiple timeframes. So if you're not aware of what a regime filter is, um, it's covered in great detail in Andreas Klenau's fantastic book, um, Stocks on the Move. Highly recommend that book if you haven't read it already. It's one of my favorite trading books. Same with Unholy Grails by Nick Raj. Um, he uh, uses a market regime filter in his trading systems as well. Um, this approach is best suited to stocks, although it does seem to show promise in crypto and certain other markets if you're creative with how you apply it. But the general concept is that the market needs to be trading above a higher time frame moving average before you start taking trades on a lower time frame. So in this case, we're on SPY, we're on the S&P 500 market index. We're on the one hour time frame, and this moving average here is a higher time frame EMA. Right now it's set to four hours, but we could set it all the way up to one week. And now you can see that it's turning green when price is trading above this moving average and turns red when it is not. And the whole concept here originally is for long only stock market strategies to only trade when the wind is behind our back. So when the market is trending upwards on those higher time frames. And this script you see down here is the regime filter script adapted to show three different timeframes. So we've got the 240 minute time frame or the um, four hour chart. We have the daily time frame and the weekly. And if I hover over these labels on the end, we can see the actual EMA value there. So what is more effective than using one market regime filter? Not necessarily three, but uh, <laughs> if one indicator is good, <laughs> then several must be even better. Now I'm joking a little bit there because a lot of traders do like to throw on a lot of indicators on their charts and that's not helpful. Uh, but in this particular case, this um, market regime filter could be useful, especially on lower time frames. So if we go down to like the 15 minute chart here um, and you had adjusted these higher time frame moving averages, you could really make a simple rules based objective method for determining your directional bias for day trading. Um, you know, sometimes it's difficult to know which way to trade a market um, when you're using just discretion. But with an indicator like this, it's pretty clear where the momentum is and which direction you should be trading in. And as a little bonus at the end of this lesson, I've implemented this new pine logging feature. If we open up the pine logs, it will actually tell us how often the market trades above all of these higher time frame moving averages. So if we go to the one hour chart again, you can see we have a 54% chance that a bar will trade on this time frame, this one hour time frame. Um, we have a 54% chance that the regime filters will all be green. What that tells us is that the market likes to trend upwards, at least on this one hour time frame, and at least since 2009 until today, which is a decent sample size, by the way. We have 20,000 one hour bars that we're analyzing here to get these numbers. So uh, yeah, interesting script here. Let's break down the source code. Uh, the source code is not particularly complex and hopefully you guys find it interesting. So let's open up the source code here and break down everything. So I've already written out the code, obviously to save time. Uh, the first thing we're doing is getting our user inputs. So we have three timeframes here. We have a moving average length, which is 20 by default. Now this isn't trading advice, but obviously depending on the time frame you're trading, these numbers will matter a lot. So on a lower time frame, you would want these higher time frame moving averages to be a lot closer to your trading time frame. So if you're trading a five minute chart, you might want the 30 minute hourly and, and uh, four hour timeframes, for example, you want the regime filter to be more sensitive to short term momentum if you're trading a short term time frame. And if you're trading a higher time frame, like the four hour or daily, you might want this to be the daily one week and one month or something like that. Same with the moving average length. The lower the time frame, typically the lower you probably want this number to be, the higher the time frame, you might want to extend it to 50, 100 or even 200, not 1200. That's probably a bit too much. The next input is our market. So this is the market we're referencing to get all of these EMA values. Um, you could get rid of this input and simply pass in the siminfo.ticker ID into all of these security function calls. And then you would just retrieve all of the market information for the uh, market that you've loaded onto your chart. But the whole point of this regime filter in its original conception is to trade it on things like individual uh, stocks. So if I go to S&P 500 here and we jump on to what looks interesting, Netflix. Now we are plotting the S&P 500's regime filters over the Netflix stock chart. And so 
what this will tell us is when the broader market is moving upwards. Um, you can see that the regime filter now does not match the price action I have on my chart because this information down here is referencing the S&P 500, while all of this, including this higher time frame moving average, is referencing Netflix's price action. And how you would typically use this uh, regime filter is to only trade these uh, members of the regime filter universe. So in this case, members of the S&P 500, when the S&P 500 is trending upwards. If you were to use this on crypto, you'd probably want to reference Bitcoin on altcoins. And if you're using it on something like Forex, maybe you want to reference the dollar index when you're trading uh, dollar denominated pairs like Euro dollar, uh, dollar yen, etc. But anyway, let's go back to the S&P 500 for now and finish breaking down the source code. So before we get any of this information, we're creating a custom security function that does not repaint. So I've gone over repainting many times in the course and on my YouTube channel. So go back and check those videos out if you are still uncomfortable with repainting. But basically, including this code here, these little historical operator checks. Um, this check is checking the real-time price information, the real-time bar. If the real-time bar is currently a real-time bar, not a historical bar, we, we reference that bar. Otherwise, if it is a historical bar, we reference the previous bar. Now, don't ask me why this expression eliminates repainting. It's just black magic that the TradingView developers have decided to uh, implement on this particular function and it works. So that's all I know. And so when you're using the security function, make sure to include this um, code expression if you do not want your script to act differently on real-time price movements compared to historical price movements. That's a big problem with uh, strategy scripts in particular. Um, if your script does not perform the same on historical data as it does in real time, then you're obviously getting dodgy backtesting results, which can lead to the development of systems that aren't profitable, but look profitable on paper. Anyway, you don't need to have this security function, this custom security function. I just implemented this into the script because it makes these lines of code a lot easier to read. Otherwise we would have um, six of these really long lines of code on these six variables. And so to make the code more readable, I've just implemented this this uh, custom function, which by the way, is easy to just copy and paste into your own scripts. And then you have your own non-repainting security function. Uh, anyway, moving on, we get our EMA values for the higher time frame. So to do that, we just get the current time frames EMA. This is what is called an expression, a code expression. And the security function requires us to pass in an expression. That's why this is called EXP, short for expression. And that's what these three are and these three are. So for our higher time frame EMAs, we are passing in the EMA expression, and this will retrieve this value from this market and this time frame. So EMA value one will be our first time frames EMA value. EMA two will be the second and so on. And same with our price values, we're getting our first time frames closing price, second closing price and third closing price. And then to validate our regime filters, for each time frame, we simply check if each time frame's closing price is above its moving average. And that's it. That's all we need for a uh, market regime filter. Now, if we just wanted to have one color down here, we could just simply add in a new uh, bool variable here called regime filter equals regime filter one and two and three, etc. Pass in those. Um, but for today's lesson, um, the student who asked this question wanted to see all three separately. So that's what we are doing here, which obviously complicates the script a little bit. Not a lot. Um, there's a bunch of code here that looks scary if you're new to PineScript, but it's all just copy and pasted blocks of code. So I'll just go over one of them and explain what's going on here. I simply wrote this code out once, copied it and pasted it three times and just changed the variables um, so that they don't conflict with each other. So for the first regime filter, I create two H lines, which are horizontal lines. That's these black dotted lines on my chart here. And once we have two H lines, if we assign them to a variable, we can then use the fill function to fill between these two H lines. And we can specify the color that we want to fill between those two lines. So to get the color of our regime filter, to make it either green or red, we simply check is regime filter one true? In other words, is the closing price of our first time frame above its moving average? If so, 
we want to fill the two H lines as green. Otherwise we want to fill it as red. And then just to make it a little bit clearer what uh, each ribbon here represents, I've added in some labels. Um, these labels here tell us which time frame each ribbon represents. That just makes it a lot easier to understand what's happening just at a glance without having to remember which ribbon is which time frame. So to do this, I create a persistent label. VAR means it does not reset on every new bar on our chart. And in fact, because we delete the label on each previous historical bar, you, you don't need these persistent variable uh, labels. So I'll get rid of them for now, just to make the code a little bit easier to read. Let's save that. This should change nothing. There we go. So we're creating a label. It's set to NA. And then we check if we are on the last bar loaded onto our chart, then delete the previous bars label and draw a new label on the current bar. Um, the reason we need to do this is because if we were to run this script on a real time uh, price chart and we had a few bars print, these labels would start to shift to the left and uh, be drawn over the top or underneath these um, ribbon colors, which obviously is not what we want. We want these to stay on the far right. So we delete old labels and create new labels. The new label just has our time frame as its text. So 240 is uh, this time frame. It has a tooltip. So if we hover our mouse over it, it will tell us what the EMA value for that time frame is. It has a transparent background color, uh, white text, and the label style is to the left, which just means that it the label looks like this. Um, however, I've set the background color of the label to transparent, so we don't actually see that. But the text is to the right of the current bar. And that's it. That's the script. Um, I've simply copy and pasted this three times. I've changed the price value that we're drawing each label. So this label is drawn at 0 0.5, which is here. This label is drawn at 1.5, which is here. And this label is drawn at 2.5, which is here. And the H lines simply draw between zero and one, one and two, two and three. And that gives us these even, um, this even scale for this particular indicator. And that's it for this script. Uh, just as a little bit of a bonus outro or conclusion, here is some code using the new uh, PineScript logs functionality. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're counting how many bars uh, passed all three regime filters. So if all three regime filters are true, then total bars passed is incremented by one. We add up how many bars had all of these filters met. If we are on the very first bar in our chart, we use the log.info function to plot a bit of text here that just says our analysis starts here. So we can see at a glance what the very first bar that our script ran on. So that was back in January of 2009. And then we check if this is the last bar on our chart, we calculate the percentage of bars on this time frame where all of our filters were met. So in this case, that's 54% of the time. So we have an obvious bullish bias on this one hour time frame from 2009 all the way till today. So that tells me that if I was to be day trading the S&P 500 on the one hour time frame, I should probably favor long trades over short trades. Objectively, the market likes to trend upwards or the momentum likes to be to the upside, uh, at least with the settings we've inputted into this current script. And then we log how many bars passed out of how many bars have drawn on our chart. So bar index on the last bar will simply be the number of total bars on our chart. And we add in the percent here so that we get all of that information. Uh, we had 11,173 bars out of 20,000 bars that passed all three filters. And then I also drew a table here, table Z or Z. Um, I don't know why I put a Z on the end. It's just, it can't be called table because that's a reserved keyword. So you can call this whatever you want. Um, but basically this table has one column with three rows. So one column, three rows, it's set in the middle center and we set each row to each time frame so that we can see which time frame, uh, which ribbon applies to which time frame, even when we go back on historical data. Now the table isn't 100% accurate. If you extend this too much, it uh, gets out of whack. 
Uh, but you get the idea. At least at a glance, we can tell the top one is the weekly, middle one is daily, bottom one is four hour. Anyway, I hope you found this lesson interesting. It's a pretty cool little application of the security function and higher time frame information. Uh, I'll leave this video here. Thanks for watching. Good luck with your trading and I'll speak with you in the next lesson. Take care.